Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. destiny, and I met mine, almost. They say when you meet the love of your life, time stops, and that's true. time starts again, it moves extra fast to catch up. Well, I don't know if that's uh, exactly the way it happened to you. Um, uh, the very first time you set your eyes on the love of your life. Uh, I don't know if everything around you suddenly came to a grinding halt and all time and space actually stood still. Uh, I don't know if that happened to you quite like that, but one thing for me, that's pretty much how it played out in my life. That the very first time I cast my gaze upon Clarice, my heart stopped beating. Uh, my watch on my wrist quit ticking, and all the universe came to a very sudden and abrupt pause, because I met the love of my life. And so I knew that if just saying that would give me some real good brownie points this afternoon. But um, Anyway, sometimes that's the way it is when uh, we meet the person of our dreams, the love of our life, that time actually does indeed stand still. Sometimes that happens. And yet that being said, the fact is that for the majority of us, uh, it's never quite as dramatic and clear as all of that. And that when it comes to what I call the monumental task, and it is a monumental task, the monumental task of finding your soulmate and your life partner, when it comes to that task, most of the time it can be about as easy as finding a needle in a haystack. And how many can say amen to that? Uh, it can be very difficult. And so that's what I want to touch on this morning. Uh, in fact, we're going to be launching uh, a brand new series of messages this morning that we're calling uh, Worth Fighting For. It's a marriage series that we're beginning this Sunday. And, um, you know, I love the statement that uh, was written on one of the, uh, on the cards that we had printed up for this uh, series. And we handed these out last Sunday. We have mailed them out to some communities in the, in the area. So maybe you're here because you got a card. Uh, but I like what it says. It says, a true relationship is made up of two imperfect people who simply refuse to give up on themselves. And how many know that pretty much says it? That uh, a marriage is really two imperfect people, two flawed people who make a commitment, a commitment to what? Never give up on themselves. And so really that's what this series is all about. We're going to be talking about some of the wisdom uh, some of the insights, some of the teachings, some of the tools that we as flawed, imperfect people can use to see that our marriages can be all that God created and called them to be. 
And you know, I love some of the titles that we came up with in this series. Uh, the first one is Weighing In, uh, Finding Your Life's Partner. That's what I'm going to be talking about today. You know, the second one is Saved by the Bell, Overcoming Incompatibility in Marriage. And so how many know there's sometimes some of that in the marriage relationship, and so you don't want to miss next Sunday for sure. The third message is Rolling with the Punches, Effective Communication in Marriage. The fourth, we call it Below the Belt, Sex and Intimacy in Marriage. And so I know some of you are saying, we're going to talk about sex, sex in church. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And then, of course, we're going to wrap it all up by touching on a message we call going the distance, making our love last. And so uh, that's where we're going with this series. I'm excited about it. I really am. It's going to be a great time together. And so how many here, you're ready, and um, you're going to be putting your gloves on? Okay, yeah, and when I say that, I don't mean gloves on and, you know, I mean not fighting with, but fighting for your marriage. And of course, as I mentioned, the place I want to start this morning is by going back to maybe where it all began, or if you're single here this morning, it might be um, going right where you are right now, and by looking at a message we call weighing in, finding your life's partner. Finding Your Life's Partner. You know, it was several years ago, singer-songwriter Gloria Estevan wrote a song with a line in it that went like this. She said, we seal our fate by the choices we make. We seal our fate by the choices we make, and of course, there's no place where that statement rings louder than when it comes to this whole area of finding our life's partner. In fact, the way I like to say it is that second to only what, what decision you will make when it comes to Jesus Christ, the person of Christ, second only to that decision, the issue of who you will marry in your life is the biggest, most monumental choice you will ever make. And so because of it, you want to make sure you go into a choice as big as that, carrying as much wisdom and insight as you possibly can. You need wisdom. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of people don't take wisdom with them. And as a result, because they don't choose right, because a lot of people don't choose right, there is an ever-increasing epidemic of very poor, ill-fated decisions when it comes to this whole area of finding a life partner. All you have to do is look at the statistics, that right now in our country, one out of every two and a half marriages will end in divorce. Uh, They tell us that since 1940, the divorce rate in our nation has risen over 240%. And so how many know what that tells me is there's a lot of broken hearts, there's a lot of broken homes, there's a lot of broken lives, broken dreams. And some of it is because people, for whatever reason, did not put enough thought, enough insight, foresight, prayer, when it comes to the choosing of the person whom they were going to spend the rest of their lives together with. So sometimes I think that we put more thought in picking the kind of home we'll live in, or maybe the kind of car we'll drive, or the computer we want to use, or the kind of coffee we will sip rather than on the person we're planning to marry. And part of the problem is that nobody really teaches us on this. They really don't. In fact, I remember growing up, I used to ask my mother every now and again, I'd say, hey, Mom, how how will I know when the right person comes along? And her answer to me was, uh, oh, you'll just know. (laughs) You'll just know. I said, I will? No, yeah, you'll just know. And I know she was trying to help me and do her best. But sometimes we need more information than just a statement that we will just know. And so this morning what I want to do is uh, unpack this whole topic for us. And um, I would encourage you to uh, take out your sermon notes and a pen. This is what they call a how-to sermon. And because it's a how-to sermon, there's going to be a lot of nuts and bolts. How-to, how-to. It's kind of like an Ikea sermon is what I call it. 
It's, it's going to come with a lot of parts, and hopefully you'll be able to put them back together. And so, you know, the first place I'd like to start is by giving you what I see as being the two most common myths, we call them myths or misconceptions, when it comes to finding our life's partner. Two of the most common myths. You know, the first one is, is the Hollywood myth. And basically, this is a mindset that says if I really, uh, all I really need when it comes to finding the love of my life is a throbbing in my chest, a quiver in my liver. You know, as long as the fireworks are going off and I feel sexually attracted to that person, then they must be the right one for me. But how many, maybe you've learned the hard way that it takes more than just sexual attraction and raging hormones to correctly determine who you should be spending the rest of your life with. Are you with me? And so that's the first myth, the Hollywood myth. Uh, the next myth is right on the other side of the universe, and that's called the heavenly myth. And this is one that says, I, all I have to do to find my life partner is sit at home, pray, read my Bible, and patiently wait for God to bring them to me. How many know that's a myth? And I know some of the, 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 the reason why you're, you're, you're laughing is because that's exactly what you've been doing. You, you, you've been sitting at home, you've been praying, you've been reading the Bible, you've been waiting, you've been looking to God, and yet the only thing that has miraculously shown up at your doorstep is the latest flyers from Sobeys or Canadian Tire. You've wondered, God, where are you? Well, the reason why that one hasn't worked, it's a myth. It's a myth. Both of them are myths. And, you know, the reason they're myths is because they are contrary to what the Bible teaches when it comes to finding the love of our lives. And so this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to dive into some things, and um, we're going to start with a scripture, really a very familiar portion of scripture, but, 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 but we'll start there and we'll go uh, move from it. And, the, and so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn them on or turn them to Proverbs 18.22. And that's where we're going to start. And out of that, I'm going to unpack something. Proverbs 18.22 as I say, a very familiar portion of Scripture for those who know your Bible. It says here that he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. He that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. You know, the first thing I want you to notice here about this verse is what it doesn't say. Okay, and then, you know, that's one way you can study the Bible, is studying it for not only what it does say, but what it doesn't say. And of course, one thing we see here that this verse doesn't say, is it doesn't say that he that is given a wife. It doesn't say that he that suddenly stumbles on a wife. It doesn't say that he that miraculously receives a wife, all gift-wrapped and delivered to his door. Now, I know some of you men are are thinking, man, I wish it said that. But it doesn't say that. It says that he who finds a wife, finds a wife. Let's say that word together, finds a wife. And you know, from my experience, the only way you can successfully find something is first of all, you have to have a clear idea what you're looking for. Right? That's how come when my wife goes to the mall, it just takes a whole lot longer than when I go to the mall. This is going to bring some contention in the home just this week. I feel it. Because when I go to the mall, I've already done my research. I've been on the internet. I know exactly what I'm looking for. I've actually cased out the map of the mall. And like a member of the SWAT team, I go in there. I go to the store. I get the item. I pay for it. And I run out. Takes me 7.3 seconds to do that. When Clarice goes to the mall, it can take 7.3 days, you know, I mean. <laughs> now, I understand she's not there to just buy something. She's there just to relax, and that's fine. And I don't have a problem with that. Maybe I do. I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll work it out in the counseling room after. 
But when I go to the mall, I know what I'm looking for. That's the first part of a successful find. You have to have a clear idea of exactly what you're looking for. And then uh, secondly, you actually have to go out and start searching for it. I call it knowing and going. Knowing and going. Those are the two overarching principles when it comes to successfully finding your life partner, knowing and then going. And so for the rest of our time together, what I want to do is I want to give you some principles that fit under that truth that we just read about knowing and going. Okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna speed it up a little bit right now. So fasten your seatbelts. How many are you ready? Okay, turn to the person next to you and say, it's time to get in the ring. Oh, man. <laughs> Knowing and going. You know, the first thing is, is eliminate the fatal flaws that go into successful mate selection. Right? You got to do that. You know, it was several years ago now that the world watched in horror as the space shuttle Columbia suddenly burst into flames, exploded into a million pieces while it was re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Every member of the crew was killed. At first, NASA had no idea what caused such a horrific accident. They didn't know. But closer examination of both the pictures and the debris that they had recovered showed that there were tiny, minute tears in the insulation surrounding one of the wings. And even though those tears were small and seemingly insignificant, they ended up causing that fatal crash. And you know, when I read that, I I couldn't help but think that in many ways that's exactly the very thing that can happen when it comes to finding a life partner. That initially it feels so good, right? It feels so good, it looks so good, I mean it must be God because, you know, they're just perfect, they just, they just, they just do something when I'm with them, all heaven breaks open, and, and, and so we might as well just jump into marriage, and that's what people do, they jump into marriage, never thinking that there might be some small but deadly flaws hiding just below the surface of the relationship. And because of it, over time, Through the bumps and storms, how many know relationships go through bumps and storms? Bumps and storms, pressures and stresses that married life can put upon a relationship. Those seemingly small and inconsequential fractures can begin to surface and cause all kinds of very deep and serious problems. And so that's why the more you can deal with these flaws, and I'm not talking about dealing with them in the other person. A lot of times it's dealing with them in you. Dealing with these flaws, the more you can identify them and deal with them before a person takes the plunge and gets into marriage, the better off you will be. And so this morning what I want to do is I want to give you just a a few of the most common fractures that tend to go into a relationship when it comes to dating. You know, the first one is people feel too rushed. Too rushed. Whenever I, uh, a couple comes to me and says, Pastor, we're so excited. We, we met each other. We're in love. And, and, and we just can't wait. We want you to marry us. Whenever some, a couple comes to me like that, the first thing I ask them is, well, how long have you known each other? And if they say something like, well, a few days... A few weeks, a few months, then to me that's a major red flag. Because how many of you know you can't even properly get to know and understand a new iPhone in that amount of time? (laughs) Yeah, amen. Usually it takes me five years and then I already got another one coming up. You can't even get to know your iPhone in that. Never mind the person you're wanting to spend the rest of your life with together. And you know, the statistics prove it. The statistics prove that that the marriages that are too rushed and done in haste face a far higher chance of just not making it over the long haul. In fact, it was several years ago, Kansas State University did a study of 15 middle-aged couples And their findings showed that those couples who had dated for more than two years, two years or more before getting married, scored consistently higher in areas of satisfaction and happiness than those who had dated for a far shorter period of time. 
And so one fatal flaw for sure is this compulsion to want to just run in, rush in, do it too quickly. You know, another fatal flaw is too young. And like it or not, the truth is that when a person is young, and I know some of you won't appreciate me saying this, but when a person is too young, they simply lack the life experience and maturity that's needed when making a decision as monumental as whom they're going to spend the rest of their life with. Again, statistics tell us that that the divorce rate for couples 20 to 22 years of age is more than double than that of what it is for couples who are 25 to 26. It's amazing. Double. Those who are 20 to 22, it's double than that of those who are 25 and 26. And so I always say it pays off to wait and get some life experience and maturity. You know, another fatal flaw is what is called too unrealistic, and that some people have what could be called a heavenly pie in the sky mindset about marriage, life, and what it's all about. They do, they go into marriage with this this heavenly mindset. You know, they look at their sweetie, their, their girlfriend, and they say, man, she's so gorgeous, she's so stunning, she will remain that wonderful princess for the rest of our lives. Of course, they haven't had a chance to see her coming downstairs with curlers in her hair and makeup. It's like a scene out of a Stephen King movie, you know, but she, they haven't seen that. Sorry. I'll behave myself. (laughs) She said, I just lost a bunch of points. (laughs) Of course, you know, she sees him as the courageous knight in the shining armor who's going to be there to, to meet her every need. She hasn't seen him. Five years after they get married, sitting on the lazy boy chair. You know, honey, do you want to do anything? No, the hockey game's on. They haven't seen that. It's just a princess. It's just a knight. They're going to ride into the sunset, live happily ever after. How many know that's fantasy? It's fiction. Because as many of you have found out the hard way, true love is not played out in the destiny of puffy, romantic clouds of marriage bliss. But rather it's forged in the fiery furnace. I came up with this line myself. I love it. (laughs) Forged in the fiery furnace of real life experience and challenges. Things like pregnancy and kids and sick kids and schedules and more sick kids and finances and sick kids again and adjustments and conflicts. (laughs) Thank you for that amen over there. There's a sick kid right there. (laughs) Minister to them, Lord. And so that's the truth about marriage. You know, John Wellwood, in an article about reality and relationship, says it like this. People often get caught up in what I call the bliss trap, imagining that love is a stairway to heaven and that it will magically lift them above the harsh elements of their life and their marriage relationship. The result is them becoming far too attracted to the heavenly side of love and leads them away to shocking disappointments. There'll be shocking disappointments when they are inevitably have to return to earth and deal with the real life challenges that go into making relationships work. And so some of the fatal flaws that go into this thing called finding our partners is too quick, the second too young, the third is too unrealistic, and then the third one is too broken. And the fact is, is that to enter into a relationship as serious as marriage, when either one or both of the people involved are simply not healed and whole enough themselves to take that journey, that is a recipe for disaster. And that if there's glaring issues, glaring issues, like anger, jealousy, 
irresponsibility, dishonesty, stubbornness, mental illnesses, addictions. If there's glaring issues, then that is a real good reason for a person to put things on hold and wait. Of course, the problem is that usually when we're dating, we're smitten with one of the most powerful drugs known to mankind. It's called the drug of infatuation. And we are just so in love. We can't see straight. I mean, they should have breathalyzers for dating couples. Man, I blew 10 points over. And when you've been smitten with the the drug of infatuation, you can't see those glaring problems. That's why sobriety, sober-mindedness, and reality is so important. And if there's glaring problems, like I just mentioned, you need to put it on hold. I say it unapologetically, that under no circumstances should a person move ahead in engagement and in marriage until the far deeper issues of personal brokenness have been properly addressed and dealt with. And so the first prerequisite that goes into finding the love of your life is eliminating many of the fatal flaws. You know, the the next thing is develop a clear mental image of your potential spouse. You need to develop an image. Have you ever heard talk to someone who says the, the very first time they met their partner, they just knew they were the one. They were the one. They just knew it. When you ask them, well, how did you know? They said, well, I don't know how I knew. I just knew they were the one. Of course, we call this love at first sight. People don't know how it happens. Some even spiritualize it. Oh, we, we, were, born, we were together in an afterlife. Right? I was a cow and she was a donkey and we just met. (laughs) And now she's a girl and I'm a guy and it's just taking up the relationship where we left off. That's a whole nother sermon. We'll wait for that one. They don't know how it works. Well, you know, if you were to dig down a little deeper into all of that, take a closer look at why people felt that way, you discover that, in fact, there are concrete reasons for their sudden attraction. It's what psychologists call principles of imaging. Imaging. And that oftentimes, without us even realizing, we have working subconsciously in us a picture, an image of what we are looking for in a partner. Most of the imaging that we have developed comes from when we grew up. It comes from, it's formed by our own parents and, and, and our family of origin. That's what's driving this thing. And of course, some of the things, some of the image is, is very good. But there's other parts of it that are bad. And so because of that, you know, I always say be proactive, be intentional when it comes to putting together the image of the person you would like to marry. And you might say, well, how do you do that? It's very simple, pragmatic. All you do is you think of the specific characters and qualities that you want in your mate after you've thought about it, write them out, put them on paper. Get that practical about it. I know that's what I did when I was single. I thought of the qualities that I wanted in a girl. um, And then I put them on paper, and that was kind of my map. Right Now the girls didn't know this. But when I went out with Clarice, I had that little paper there. Yeah. Passed on that one. Hallelujah. You know, it's not like I took the paper out and I said, okay, now that we've had our dessert, how are you with this one? And this one, and this one. You know, it, it's, it doesn't have to be that strange. It's just you have an idea. You have an idea of what your mate is, is like and, 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 and should be like. And so that becomes your image. And, and that can help tremendously. Now, some of you are saying, well, what, would you, what kind of things would go on that list? Well, you know, if you put uh, number one on the list, you know, has to have as much money as Bill Gates, you need to go back to the first point. Get some of that brokenness worked out of you. That, 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 those kind, kind of things don't go on the list. The first thing, things like personality, right? Is he an extrovert? Is she an introvert? Are they quiet? Are they loud? Are they serious? Are they fun? Are they intense? Are they laid back? Things about personality is important. 
issues of intelligence. And I don't know how to say it, but the reality is, 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 is that you probably don't want to be marrying an Einstein if you have the same IQ as your dress size. I'm sorry. We can delete that from the message. We could, right? You know, think about it. There you are out on a date. He's talking about quantum physics. Oh, dividing an atom. We're going to split the atom. And you're saying, my, look at that. They have a sale at Winners next week. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, what about appearance, right? That should play into it, something to do with appearance. You know, like we're not all looking for Tom... Who am I saying? Tom Hanks. <laughs> we better not be... Tom Cruises, you know, but there should be something to do with, with, with appearance. You know, ambition has a lot to do with it. Like, you know, if, if you're a high energy person and you don't want to start dating someone who, you know, their goal in life is to beat the next level of the video game. What do you want to do? It's our day off coming up. What do you want to do? I just want to stay in my basement in my underwear and finish the video game. Is that a red flag? How many are with me today, okay? You know, of course, character is, is, is huge. That's huge. A whole sermon could be preached on that. Character, what are they like under pressure? How do they treat their family? What are they like with their mom and their dad? What do their friends say about them? What are they like when someone cuts them off in traffic? Wow, it's getting quiet in here. <laughs> you know, what about things like values, right? It's important. I remember I went on a date, and I didn't do a lot of dating uh, after I became a Christian. But I remember I went out on a date with a gal from the church, and, you know, we were just sitting around chatting, and I asked her, I said, so, you know, what are your goals? You know, what are your values? Like, what do you want to be when you grow up, kind of? She said, well, you know, she was an a, a air, airline stewardess. Well, what I'd like to do is, is I'd like to buy a big house, fill it with all kinds of beautiful furniture, and travel all around the world, go to exotic places. We'd be traveling all the time, collecting all these wonderful things, putting them in, in our wonderful house. And I said, well, what about kids? Oh, no, I don't want any of them. I'm just getting away. And then she looked at me and she said, well, what do you want to do? And at that time, I really, I believed that I was going to be a missionary to China. And so I got so fired up. I said, I'm, I want to be a missionary to China and go into the, to, to places where no one's gone before and preach the gospel and maybe even die on the mission field. <laughs> she said, oh, I think it might be time to call it a night. <laughs> Uh, how many think values are important? And then, of course, the last one and most important of all is commitment to Christ, you know. You want to be dating someone. If you're a Christian, you want to be dating someone who's committed to Christ. You say, oh, he's such a nice guy. I watch him. He's so polite. He gave to the United Way not once but three times last year. He's such a sweetheart. He's almost like a Christian himself. Matter of fact, he's even sweeter than some Christians I know. I know he doesn't like church and he doesn't read the Bible. And his, time, his idea of having a good time is getting a 12-pack of, of, of Canadian club, no, of, of, of Bud Light. <laughs> That'd be something. <laughs> But you know what? I'll, he, when I marry him, he'll become a Christian. It's called missionary dating. It's the craziest thing in all the world. You know, it's almost like I'm dating this bum. But as soon as we get married, it'll be like a magic wand. An anointing will come upon him, and he'll go from bum, Bible hater, to Jesus lover. You know, the way I say it is the only thing that changes 
after you get married is your postal address and your insurance rate. <laughs> and if you think that guy that you're dating or that girl that you're dating is all of a sudden going to have an epiphany of transformation and turn into a fi on fire Christian just because of your influence, you need to think again. It's quiet in here. <laughs> Commitment to Christ is key. You know, I've been doing this long enough. I've been pastoring Clarice and I for 30 years. The broken lives, the broken marriages we have seen because of a wrong start, a lot of it comes down to this one. Amen? You know, the third one is find a person who's a lot like you. Now, I know as soon as you hear that, people will say, well, pastor, I heard that opposites attract. I heard that, and it's true. Opposites attract. But, you know, they have proven, the evidence shows that uh, at first opposites attract, but over time the very things that often attracted us together can actually start being the very places of problems and strife. Recently, a team of researchers at the University of Ontario conducted a study with three groups of married couples. Each group consisted of 35 couples. The first group were couples who were happily married. The second group were couples who were, were having some serious problems in their marriage but were still planning on staying together. The third group were couples who admitted that they could no longer make the relationship work and they were probably going to end in divorce. You know, when they did the study, they found that the far happier, more satisfied couples were those who had significantly similar interests and that their family and their backgrounds, their verbal skills, their energy level, their activities, their hobbies, their likes, their dislikes were all very similar to their spouses. It just meant a more solid relationship. And so the principle spells out like this. Every similarity is an asset. Every difference is a liability. Right? And so a relationship is like a bank account. The more deposits you put into it, the stronger and, and healthier it becomes. Of course, the opposite is true. The, the, the more withdrawals you take out, the weaker and more bankrupt those relationships can be. And so the key is to maximize your deposits. And the way you maximize your deposit is by finding a person who is like you, similar to you. Now, I'm not saying similar in personality. I mean, if any of you know Clarice and I, you'll know that she's the outgoing, she's the driven, aggressive, kind of abrasive one, and I'm the quiet and gentle, peaceful one. I think I got that mixed up, so... So you know we have totally different uh, uh, personalities, but when you go past the personalities, we have a lot of the same kind of likes and values. We, we, we harmonize in so many ways. That has done so much to strengthen our relationship. And so you want to look for people, a person who is like you. You know, number four is learn how to deal, clear conflict off the relationship road. Conflict, And, you know, inevitably conflict is going to come. Uh, you know, when Clarice and I were dating, we used to play a game called Tetris. How many have ever heard of that game? It used to drive me crazy, that game, because she was so much better at it than me. But the way Tetris works is you have all these different shapes coming down quite quickly, and the goal of the game is to deal with them as they come so you don't stack it up and the game is over. You get disqualified. And you know, really the same thing is true when it comes to relationships. That our ability to successfully find and keep the love of our lives is directly related to us being able to deal with the multiple of problems and conflicts and hurts and misunderstandings as they are coming our way. That's a key. And so there's some people who are good at it. There's other people who don't deal with it very well at all. They're not good at dealing with conflict. And as a result, um, they can only bring their relationship to a certain point. Their relationship stays at a certain level or breaks up. And basically, there are two extremes when it comes to conflict dealing. You know, the first is avoiding it at any cost. This is someone who says, I don't do conflict. Sorry. 
I'll just hide in the bathroom, right? I'll just go for a walk. I don't do conflict. And of course, the other extreme is they created at every turn. I call them conflict addicts. These are people who use conflict like a drug, stirring it up, firing it up. In almost every situation, the key is striking a balance. And so I just want to say that if you are single right now and you're dating, you need to ask yourself, how well are we at dealing with conflicts? Because that will play a huge role in how healthy your marriage will be. Of course, the next one is, 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 is get yourself healthy before you get yourself married. A great marriage requires two healthy people, and what that means is that the time for you to start getting yourself healthy is not after you've walked down the aisle and tied the knot, but rather the time to get healthy is now before you do it. Because as many of you have found out, I already mentioned, marriage is not some magic wand that you miraculously uh, uh, wave over somebody and poof, all the flaws and the faults are gone. In fact, the way I like to say it is marriage is, is more like a magnifying glass that actually intensifies, surfaces many of the flaws and problems that are already there. And so that's why you want to do your best to deal with the flaws and the cracks and the crevices right now before you get married. I, I strongly encourage people to do that. It's a real key. You know, number six is allow your feelings to mature into full-blown love. And the only way a relationship can successfully get to where it needs to go is when both parties are willing to get past what I call the adolescent phase of infatuation. Move to a deeper level. In his book entitled Finding the Love of Your Life, Neil Clark Warren, who by the way is the founder of eHarmony, he's a born-again Christian, he says there are some people who just don't stick it out when the flames of passion begin to fade. They don't stick it out. And that's why it's so vital that we take the time to allow our adolescence infatuation to grow into a far deeper, more mature kind of love. And I'll tell you, the only way that can happen is when a relationship goes through a crisis. But I know some 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 people who they they're dating. The relationship goes through the crisis, and you know what? They can't let go. She says, oh, he got mad at me the other night. I better text him, see if he's okay. Oh, it's been 558 texts. Well, one more won't hurt. Let the guy go. Let the relationship cool off. Let it go through a furnace. Don't hold on to something that God wants to take deeper or either end. And so you need to have the wisdom to know, hey, if our relationship really is of God and we've just all of a sudden split, let's give it to God and see what happens at the end of the fire. Amen? You know, the last one is develop a spiritual life that really works really works. You know, when the time came for me to finally become internet savvy, and that was a while ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, no, when it came time for me to sign up for email, I did it with two understandings in mind, two two things that I understood would happen, right? The first thing is that uh, for me, um, I understood that I would be able to create and send emails. That was my first understanding. And the second understanding is that I would receive and be able to read them. I know it's not rocket science, but uh, that was the twofold purpose, right? Write and send emails, receive and read them. And really, it shouldn't be any different when it comes to our spiritual life, our walk with God. That we should be able to create prayers and send prayers and petition prayers to God. But not only that, we should be able to receive and answer prayers and guidance back on the behalf of the prayers that we've sent to Him. In other words, it's called two-way communication. 
And because of that, we ought to be concerned. And, and let me say this um, as, as, as clearly as possible. We ought to become concerned if all we ever do in our relationship with Christ are sending prayer after prayer to heaven, never receiving anything back. Because a sure sign of true, healthy, vibrant, spiritual living is when you talk to God and He talks back to you. And let me just say that the, 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 the area of finding your life's partner, it, it's absolutely critical. It's crucial in this particular area. It's critical that you get as much insight and wisdom and direction and leading from heaven when you are looking for the love of your life. Absolutely critical. And that's why after dating for a while and we saw that things were getting more serious, what Clarice and I did, and I know this might seem strange to some of you, but what we did is both of us went on an extended fast. And during that fast, we said we're not going to see each other for that period of time. And when I say fast, I'm not talking about just a half a day or, or skipping our daily Starbucks or anything. Both of us went on a 10-day fast, and we sought the Lord fervently. We both come from divorced homes, her parents' divorce, my parents' divorce. The worst, last thing we wanted is to enter into a marriage and have the wheels fall off that one as well. And so because we knew how crucial the, 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 the decision was, we both went on a 10-day fast. We didn't call or see each other for the next 10 days. And when we came back, we, we, we were hungry for two things. The first was food. And the next was, what did God tell you? So I said, what did God tell you? She said, you tell me what he told you. No, you go first. No, you go first. And she said, God, give me a big fat green light. And I said, Woohoo! Because he gave me a green light too. Hallelujah! <laughs> we were in a pizza place at the time. The waiter thought we'd gone crazy or something, but a green light. We'd heard from heaven. You know what? It, because of the seriousness of the decision, it's vital you hear from heaven. God's promise to you is that you can hear from heaven. Jeremiah 33, uh, verse 33 says, Call to me and I will answer you, and I will tell you wonderful and marvelous things that you know nothing about. God wants to lead you and guide you when it comes to the whole area of finding the love of your life. Isaiah 30, verse 31 says, You will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Follow it. Whatever it turns to the, whether it turns to the right or the left, that is God's promise to you. Get close to Him. Have a relationship with Him. Dig down deep into the, your spiritual well, and you'll find that God's still small voice will lead and guide you. I love this in James. If any of you lack wisdom, you should pray. To God, who will give it to you because God gives generously and graciously to all. God wants to help you out in this crucial area. And then, of course, the last one is in Proverbs, where there is no counsel, the people fail, but in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. And so I'm telling you to, to use the community that God has given you when it comes to choosing your life partner. Use your family. Use your parents. They have far more wisdom than you. Don't hide away. I get concerned when couples start dating and then they just start hiding away, meeting by themselves, sort of putting up blockages and, and, and not sharing their lives. That, to me, that is, a, that is a warning sign. You need your parents. You need to take your boyfriend home to meet your parents, even if he's nervous and doesn't want to go. Your girlfriend needs to meet your parents. You need to get the opinion of your parents. And the way I say it is if your parents aren't 100% on board, that becomes a red flag. Now, that doesn't mean you don't get married, but that is something worth investigating. 
It's community, wisdom from community. You know, you want to find out what your spiritual leaders are saying. What is your pastor saying? What are the elders of the church saying about your relationship? That becomes a guidepost. And through community, that's the way the church works. God will give wisdom and direction. Amen? And so chances are time and space isn't simply going to suddenly stand still when the right one enters the room. And yet that being said, God has given us all kinds of great tools and help, wisdom, guidance we need when it comes to effectively finding and meeting and eventually marrying the loves of our lives. God has given us what we need, and His promise is that He will be with us every step of the way, leading and guiding, instructing and coaching us, if will but Listen and trust. Listen and trust.